next speaker is uh, Brian Jones, and he's a research associate professor. And if you think that was cool, wait till you see his slides. So, uh, really raising the bar high for him here. But he's going to talk about some retinal remodeling and some of the uh, degenerative diseases of the retina. So, Uh, 
in bionics and biologicals and gene therapy and optogenetics uh, that aren't taking this real biology into account. So um, we started collecting human tissues. This is a, a, a normal human retina. Uh, uh, actually, it's probably early AMD. Uh, it did not have a diagnosis when we got it. Uh, but the reason I say it's normal, probably early AMD is this is one of the first things that we see in AMD. So this is uh, the retinal pigment epithelium up here. And in normal, healthy retinal pigment epithelium, you shouldn't see any color variability in this particular label. So this particular label is actually three separate labels. It's taurine, it's a small molecule taurine, a small molecule glutamine, and a small molecule glutathione that are assigned to red, green, and blue color channels. And that gives us this sort of view where we can visualize mirror cells in gold and then photoreceptors and, and some of the other cells. But it also allows us to see nicely the RPD here. And as I'll show you in a minute, uh, in, in normal healthy tissue, you don't see any variability there. And we think that this is actually the first indication of um, uh, disease uh, implications in dry AMD, at least. Uh, here's another view where we've changed the labels. Uh, this is GABA in the red color channel, or lysine in the green color channel, and glutamate in the blue color channel. This allows us to see excitatory and inhibitory neurons in here. So, so the important thing with this normal human retina is, even though there are some indications of disease, uh, the overall topology is, is, is intact. Photoreceptors out here, you can see cone photoreceptors standing up here. There's the outer nuclear layer, inner plexiform layers, and inhibitory endocrine cells, and on cone uh, uh, bipolar cells here, and the ganglion cells down there with some vascular elements. Um, Here's a normal, happy primate retina. Uh, we can, it turns out we can get primate tissues, non-human primate tissues, faster than we can get human tissues. Um, this was collected uh, within about 20 minutes post-mortem, and a lot of the signals are a little fresher. Uh, but the important thing here is to look at the RPE. So this is this signature, this fingerprint, uh, is what normal RPE looks like. And you can, you can profile all the RPE cells in, in a normal human you'll get absolutely this. Um, so uh, again, so if you keep this in mind, normal healthy retina, ganglion cells down here, uh, here's the optic fiber layer down there. Um, again, we can switch it. Uh, this is the view that allows us to see excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Um, but again, normal lamination, everything looks really, really, really happy and healthy. This is central retina from a person with uh, RT, about 74 years old, NLP. Uh, no uh, visual percepts. Uh, the interesting thing is the IPL in this particular guy um, was largely intact. Uh, there are almost no, there, there's no uh, rod photoreceptors. There are a few cone photoreceptors, and, and this is actually important. Uh, we'll come back to it in a minute. And this is gamma glycine glutamate labeling. We, uh, can, if we can get the tissue fresh enough, it's still alive. Uh, and we can do some experiments. We have a molecule called one amino four monodobutane. It's a non-selective glutamate channel marker. So, so we basically put the retina in H and B uh, and stimulate the retina with uh, uh, pharmacologics like canic acid and MDA or with light. Uh, in this case, light wouldn't do much. Um, and glutamate channels open up. H and B flows into these channels. And so we can get a visual picture for which neurons have been activated. So, so we basically recorded from every single neuron in this tissue. The more green in, uh, in a particular cell, the more HB that's flowed in. So uh, we can do this HB labeling in addition to our other small molecular uh, markers. And what we can do is we can generate a classification mask. And so what we can do uh, is we can find all the horizontal cells, and we can find the ganglion cells and the inhibitory endocrine cluster, you can uh, get rich ganglion cells in the different bipolar cell classes. Um, here, and so the interesting thing here is in normal mammalian retina, the bipolar cell classes, <coughs> your on cone bipolars, your off bipolars, and your rod bipolars, you should have about 33% of each. Right? So there should be equal, equal numbers of uh, equal ratios of, of those uh, bipolar cells. The first thing that starts happening in uh, RP, and we've seen this in animal models and now we've heard it in humans, is that these ratios change. 
Uh, and what you see is uh, you see the oncome bipolar cells dramatically reduce in number, and the off bipolar cells dramatically increase in number. So in, in this particular case, they, they effectively double. Um, and that's that's interesting. Um, even though the retina, even though the topology of the retina is intact, you, you can still see some cone photoreceptors up here. Uh, and it turns out, as long as cones are present, the overall topology of the retina is maintained. As, as we'll see in a minute, when the cones disappear, that that sort of uh, restraint disappears. So uh, here's another region uh, of retina, uh, and this is the YGE. We're going to look at TQE. Just to slide that down. Uh, so again, taurine glutamine, glutamate, uh, GABA, glycine glutamate, glycine around this. So the, these are the same cells that you're seeing in both. We're just visualizing them differently so that we can see different things. And the first thing to look at is we're starting to get, so here's a, a retinal pigment epithelium cell that's died in this particular case. Um, and then we can uh, look down here. Uh, and this is actually very interesting. The grad student in the lab now, she's chasing this problem aggressively. Um, so normally Mueller cells should all be the same color too. They all have the same small molecular family, right? Uh, and interestingly, um, this is the case across species. So birds, turtles, fish, uh, mammals, uh, this sort of signature, this mammalian Mueller cell signature, the job that the Mueller cells do in metabolic space is very robustly maintained across evolution. But what starts happening when, when retinas get stressed is we start seeing this variability in the mirror cells. So the metabolism in the mirror cells starts and it starts stretching that sort of metabolic envelope. And they start doing some very different things. And we can start visualizing that here. Um, so, so in these particular mirror cell columns, uh, there's more taurine in them, and so they're going more red than the, the, than the regular sort of looking mirror cells here. This is also true on the ultrastructural level. If you look at the ultrastructural uh, data that I'm not going to show here, um, there's lots of protein changes uh, that start happening as well. We can see that um, with electron microscopy. If we look at these boxes, uh, so, so this one is just to show you that there are some cone photoreceptors, even though they're sort of nubbins. Uh, the nubbin in the outer segment, uh, the outer segment is, is still left, but it's helping to maintain the over, overall topology of the retina. This box we're going to sort of zoom in on uh, here. And the, the important thing here is to look at sort of these fine processes that are coming up from glycinergic gamma print cells. So normally glycinergic gamma print cells, cell bodies here, and the processes come down to connect in this inner plexiform layer down here. In this case, they're starting to project up in the wrong direction. Right? We actually saw this in the animal models first, but what they start doing is um, when, when you effectively deafferent the retina and you remove photoreceptor input, all the cells downstream have two choices. They can either die, which a lot of them do, or they start sprouting. And they start sprouting these processes and they start talking to other neurons. And they do this likely to maintain calcium regulation and gene sig uh, calcium signaling and gene regulation. Um, uh, and there may be some other mechanisms for that, but this is a, a very common finding, this sort of sprouting. Uh, it turns out if you look at the ultrastructure, there are synapses in these spreads. So these are not sort of quiet um, processes. They're active processes where, where these cells are finding other partners uh, that they shouldn't be talking to, but they do. Things can get really weird. Uh, this, these are amacrine cells in the subretinal space. So these are cells that have migrated up from uh, where they normally live, and they're now taking up residence out here. So, so in addition to sort of the sprouts, the cell bodies can migrate and, and go in weird places. Uh, and then uh, we've taken a punch here. So this is a, a three millimeter punch from UNRP. And uh, so look at the red stripe here. Uh, we basically took a histologic slice right out of there. Uh, and we wanted to look at far periphery retina. So the idea is that the, the data that I showed you before was sort of more central retina. Uh, and because RP is sort of the periphery of the central disease, we want to see how bad it can get. So uh, we looked at OCT, not a whole lot of OCT signal, not a whole lot to see. Um, but if we look at the YGE, 
Uh, there's basically a lot of vascular uh, components. The vascular components have sort of become hypertrophic. Uh, there's almost nothing left of, of, of a normal retina. There's, there, there is nothing to see, which is why you couldn't see anything in OCT. Um, there are some Mueller glia elements here. Turns out there's some astrocytic elements from some other work that Becker Pfeiffer, the grad student that I told you about, uh, is, is working on chasing. Uh, but almost all the ganglion cells are gone. Uh, a lot of the uh, GABAergic inhibitory uh, neurons are gone. Uh, Glycinergic ganglion cells are still left. Most of the bipolar cell population is gone, and all of the bipolar cells are effectively gone. This is, uh, for all intents and purposes, a, a dead retina. Uh, there's no rescue in this. Uh, these are other mappings. This is taurine glutamate glutamate uh, to show you sort of the glial components that are still there. Uh, here's some proteins, uh, GFAT, uh, CRLVP, and arginine. Uh, we're sort of trying to look at some protein, which, which proteins are still left. Uh, so uh, small molecules change much more rapidly than the proteins do. Uh, and this is a probe for adopsin. So there are no, so normally you should be able to see nice pretty photoreceptors up here. The only opsins uh, that we can see are sort of trapped uh, in, uh, in around these vascular elements that are probably uh, uh, sucked down uh, and, and failed to metabolize. Uh, so this is uh, another sort of stretch of the peripheral retina. Uh, again, just to show you how bad things can get. Uh, so this is uh, a little distance away from that red stripe that we showed you earlier. And again, this is what a normal retina and normal retina thing should look like. So if you sort of take this bottom edge, this vitreal edge down here, uh, and sort of go up, this is where the disease retina stops, and that's how much further it should go. So um, the idea is, that, uh, in RP at least, uh, this is completely scrambled. Uh, and these, this is sort of a, if we took a horizontal section through the retina, through the Mueller cell, so if we sectioned into the screen just a little bit more, we'd be into the vitreous. This is just before we get to the vitreous, and so these are all the Mueller cells in feet. In normal, happy, healthy tissue, you should see this nice sort of mosaic of tiles. Uh, but it should all be the same signal. Uh, this is clearly disrupted. There's a lot of stretching going on. There's some vascular elements that are sort of pushing in. And the signatures are all different. Right? So this is glutamine synthetase, taurine, and glutamine, and red, green, and blue. Uh, and again, uh, this is showing that there's effectively metabolic chaos in, in Mueller cells. And this is sort of another question. At what point? So, so Mueller cells are really important for maintaining normal homeostasis in, in retina. They help exchange small molecular components and recycle uh, a lot of uh, components for uh, neurotransmitters. Uh, and so the question that arises, how far can you sort of push the metabolism in the Mueller cells and expect retinas to be able to function normally? Uh, this is another map of taurine and glutamine just to show you again the, the diversity gets pretty crazy. So uh, the other recent paper that we just published uh, was AMD. Um, so this is sort of the classic view that a lot of you guys look at. Um, nice sort of uh, pretty interesting uh, fundoscopy. We can sort of zoom in again, and we can see these nice sort of pretty interesting form and some sort of pigmented structures here. Um, here's some histology. There's some knife cuts through here. I apologize. But again, uh, let me sort of direct you to the RPE. Again, this sort of tiled appearance, which should be absolutely smooth and, and uh, influence signatures. There's a small drone right there. Uh, this is very early. This is toward the glycine and glutathione mapping. Uh, and this was uh, just looking at taurine. So this is uh, just looking at the RPE here. So here's the vascular choroid, and here's some photoreceptor outer segments. This was a cool image because it shows you the tiling that goes on. So each one of these is separate retinal pigment epithelium cells, right? And normally, they're coupled. So there are gap junctions between them. And that allows the small molecular signals to flow in between them. And that's why the signature is absolutely uniform in normal healthy tissue. What's happened is uh, the gap junctions have become uncoupled. And each one of these cells is doing their own thing. Um, we suspect that leads to dysfunction. And so what we're starting to see, uh, we don't quite know what they are, but these are taurine-rich deposits, sub-retinal, sub, sub components. 
Uh, who knows, actually? Uh, there's, there's some argument. When we published this paper, there was, we actually argued back and forth with three of the reviewers on exactly what these were. Um, uh, we, we don't quite know, but what we think is that it's, it's failed uh, outer segment uh, metabolism. So the, the RPE is no longer phagocytosing effectively in the outer segments of photoreceptors. And we're starting to get debris that builds up underneath uh, the RPE, which leads to oxidative stress and, and ultimately cell death. But it's just the arrow that goes across. Um, here's some other early AMDs. This was OCT, not great. But here's the histology with taurine. Again, uh, we've got uh, some nice uh, drusen deposits. Uh, and so the question is, um, what's going on underneath uh, these subdrusen, or these uh, subretina underneath the, these drusen deposits? Uh, again, you can start to see the RPE that's becoming uncoupled in and around the cells. And then we can start to see changes in metabolism. So, so this cone photoreceptor here, did I highlight that? Yes. Uh, this cone photoreceptor here has a very different signature than the cone photoreceptors on the other side, the same in this box as well. So we're starting to see sort of the earliest signs of metabolic dysfunction in cones underneath these drusen deposits. Right? So something is happening to the RPE uh, and it's uh, causing uh, downstream uh, cell stresses in, in the photoreceptors. Uh, here's another uh, early AMD, again, uh, variations in RPE coupling. Uh, this is looking at oxygen, a cone oxygen. So when the things that start happening is uh, you get uh, buildups, uh, buildup of, of debris underneath the RPE, and uh, oxygen delocalization. So normally the oxygen should be up in the cone outer segments. It's delocalizing down around the inner segments and down even to the uh, synaptic end where it synapses with bipolar cells. This uh, is sort of an indication to us of, of cell stress. Uh, there's another image of early AMD photoreceptors are starting to get shorter in this particular one. Um, but down here, we're starting to see the same signals in the Mueller cells. So the Mueller cells, again, like RP, the, the um, Mueller cell signals are starting to diverge uh, and they're no longer uh, uniform. Zoom out a little bit here to sort of show you the, the signals that are starting to change. We don't know if this is um, a dynamic process. Uh, these are just individual snapshots in time. And we don't know if metabolically these cells are ringing, if metabolism is if taurine or glutamine in these cells is coming and going in waves. And we're just capturing this particular cell with up, uh, up regulation of taurine while this particular newer cell right next to it has normal taurine. We don't know that yet. This is important because it shows, again, uh, in early AMD, uh, early to mid-AMD, uh, in this stretch, we don't have any drusen, but there, there's some drusen in other areas. The, uh, the cholesterol and gamma can cells are starting to spread again. And so uh, in this cell, uh, this patient still had vision, um, but the visual performance was likely declining. So uh, endocrine cells and horizontal cells do a lot of sort of spectral tuning of signals, help you sort of refine your visual performance. Uh, and this may be some of the earliest sort of cellular histologic uh, evidence that um, the circuitry in the retina is breaking down. Oh, yeah, we can sort of zoom out to show you some of the spreading a little bit better here. Uh, this is uh, GABA uh, here. So this is, these are GABAergic endocrine cells with GABAergic processes uh, coming from uh, endocrine cells going in the wrong direction. Here's a, a case in a late AMD. Uh, we're starting to get some vascular involvement here. A nice big sort of healthy drusen. Um, there's the YG, or the uh, yeah, GABA less glutamate signal. And we're going to zoom in on the area here where you can start to see uh, photoreceptors are, are, are dying off and being lost. The IPL is getting a little more sort of loose, uh, and uh, we're starting to see uh, changes to the retina underneath. Uh, same thing in Mueller cells, you can't really see it with this projector, but the, the signals are starting to change in the drugs as well. So the same, the, the, the model that sort of holds in AMD, MRP, uh, and, and any other disease uh, that causes photoreceptor cell death 
uh, is that there's uh, it sort of happens in phases. Um, photoreceptors get uh, stressed. Uh, the outer segments sort of shrink, uh, and uh, rods are lost. Um, as long as the cones are present, the overall topology lamination is good. Cell populations seem to be intact, and maybe some spreading is starting to occur, but everything looks pretty good at this point. By phase three, when cones start to die, we get early uh, neurite remodeling from uh, GABA, uh, GABAergic and glycemic endocrine cells. Uh, horizontal cells actually also aggressively participate in this, as do ganglion cells. Uh, and then by late phase, there's global remodeling, there's massive cell loss, massive uh, sort of topological restructuring of the retina. We've done a lot of molecular work um, in these phases. So in phase one, we get uh, neurogenesis, uh, increase of photoreceptor cell markers. In phase two, which is the ONO ablation, where we get changes in glutamate channel expression. I showed you some of those data, but we also get changes in retinoic acid signaling. Um, and uh, once the cones start going, uh, a lot of these signals uh, continue. We get changes in glutamate channel expression. Uh, lower two receptors go up, lower five receptors go down, and lower six receptors go down. And then we start getting changes in proteins as well. Uh, this is an area that uh, Beck is chasing for her PhD dissertation right now. Uh, it turns out um, there are some massive changes in glutamine synthetase and um, once GS uh, disappears it never comes back. And so the, there's a real question in late stage disease if you can even sort of rescue uh, retinas once the uh, glutamine synthetase, which normally turns over photoreceptor uh, or uh, neurotransmitter molecules uh, goes away. So the translational component comes um, because a lot of people are looking at ways to sort of intervene. And um, bionics is one of the big sort of approaches. So, so there's a couple of ways to do bionics. One, you can sort of put a bionic implant underneath the retina and you can surgically detach the retina and slip the bionic implant in with the idea that you stimulate the surviving retina. Uh, the more uh, uh, Diverse, uh, the more successful uh, in terms of sort of the market um, penetration seems to be the upper retinal implants, but you put them down, the idea is to stimulate the ganglion cells. The problem is there's a field effect, uh, and so you have to sort of ask yourself, you know, which cell populations are you stimulating? Um, even if you say, okay, well, we're only verbally stimulating the ganglion cells, it's, it's, it's still a problem. Um, there are also, 12 to 20 channels of outflow from ganglion cells to, and it just doesn't go to visual cortex, it goes to subcortical areas, it goes to superior collecular cell genome, a lot, a lot of different places. So, so you're sort of stimulating these ganglion cells in a lot of cases. Um, well, in all cases, when you're, when you're using bionic implants. There are some other approaches uh, to do optogenetics. Uh, we've done some of these studies. Uh, where you can take a, a virus and uh, engineer it in uh, an, an opsin. Uh, basically, uh, if photoreceptors disappear, you can put the opsin in surviving cells, and the idea is the light comes into the retina and hits these uh, cells that have been genetically transduced uh, so that you can express the opsin, and then uh, the thinking is that these cells then stimulate uh, the surviving retina. The massive assumption here is that once you do this, that the retina will stop degenerating. And it turns out uh, we did some early experiments in retinal remodeling, this process that we call this sort of plasticity. It's a freight train. And because you put a little bicycle in front of the freight train, it doesn't stop the freight train. The freight train is still <laughs> going down the track. Right? So um, we, we intervened uh, with optogenetics, and um, we waited uh, for, and tracked the animals for a couple more years. And, um, the retina is just going to help, uh, even with the optogenetic therapies. So, um, but uh, the assumption is that you know, we're going to um, you can stimulate bipolar cells, uh, you can stimulate amacrine cells, in this case, like two amacrine cells, or you can put in optogenetics in ganglion cells. And, and and there's a lot of very cool evidence that, that this works. In fact, the first guy that did it really got kind of jerked around. This guy Pan at, at Wayne State. University was the first to actually show that you could do optogenetic therapy in retinas, and he largely got ignored. Uh, he presented that article in 2005, and it was the 
single coolest thing I saw that year at Argo. And um, Stanford is a little better at promoting their people. And uh, uh, there's some very talented people, actually. Ed Boyden is wonderful. He's now at MIT. Uh, and Carl Fisseroff um, really got most of the fame for, for actually doing this optogenetically. Uh, and, and there are a lot of reasons why that, why that happened. But, but Pan was the first guy to actually do this. So uh, the problem with all this is, even if you do successfully transduce these cells, um, the cells die, the cells rewire, um, and, and this circuitry substrate changes. And so then the question is, um, how bad does it change? And the other main mission uh, of our lab, this is sort of Robert Marks' baby, was that uh, we studied how the normal retina is wired. So these are two A2 endocrine cells. Uh, and it turns out there's a very specific structure, there are very specific synapses and gap junctions that all of these cells make with other populations of cells in the retina. Uh, and uh, it's uh, very tightly constrained, the, 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 signal, the, the cell partners that they normally partner with. Um, and so it turns out we can uh, identify these, actually, we, we can go in and pick in our connect on this volume, we can pick synapses and gap functions and actually visualize them in electron microscopy. And we construct this and make these beautiful sort of figures. Uh, and then we can sort of make these connection diagrams. So here's one of those A2N endocrine cells here. And we can start mapping out broad bipolar cell input onto it. And there's another gathering of endocrine cell input. Uh, and then we can sort of start mapping this out. The trick is, um, it gets really complicated. Right? <laughs> so this is just two synaptic hops away from that A2 endocrine cell. Um, and so if you start asking yourself in retinal degeneration, um, which one of these connections gets broken, um, and how many of them can you break and still expect normal retinal signal processing to occur, um, that's kind of where we're at now. We're trying to figure out what goes wrong, where, uh, and then there's a lot of modeling that can be done to try and figure out how bad can you get? Uh, at what point can you no longer intervene uh, with bionic or biological uh, approaches? I'll just wrap this up real quick. So uh, we've done some bionic work with people. Turns, uh, we've done some optogenetics work, and we've done some cell-based work. Turns out uh, underneath bionics, the modeling is accelerated in a lot of these cases. And uh, this is distressing. In optogenetics, the, like, as I told you, the, uh, modeling progress um, just proceeds, just keeps going down the track. Um, we've done some cell transplants. Um, turns out the modeling is accelerated in the transplant. So uh, we haven't done a lot of genetics yet. Uh, there's some other experiments we'd love to do with Wolfgang, um, and, and the question's open there. The basic take home message is that there's a lot of rules that are happening in the retina, uh, and we need to understand what the rules are. Lab, these are some more collaborators. Uh, and, uh.